disappoint me. Not very wise. God of War Ragnarok, developed by Sony Santa Monica Studios and directed by Eric Williams, has become the fastest selling PlayStation game of all time, earning many industry awards and currently sitting at a 94% on Metacritic. Many have called it a masterpiece and it will surely go down as one of the best games of all time. Then again, only time will tell. After all, the original release of The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword for the Nintendo Wii in 2011 has a 93% on Metacritic, a game that, when remastered for the Nintendo Switch in 2021, announced as part of its advertising campaign that the motion controls were now optional, that your chatterbox puzzle ruiner of a companion fee could be ignored, and hilariously demonstrated in the trailer itself that the game would no longer explain to you what a rupee is every time you loaded your save file. <laughs> a masterpiece. As a huge fan of the original God of War trilogy and an even huger fan of the 2018 reboot, I anticipated God of War Ragnarok to be a dunk so slammed that it would shatter the backboard of my expectations. Not only does God of War Ragnarok flub the dunk, it airballs the free throw. I'll put it in blunt terms. I got beef with God of War Ragnarok. Yay! I'm not going to go over every single nitpick I have with Ragnarok's narrative, or else we'd uh, be here all day. So instead, I'll narrow it down to five key screenwriting concepts, which are narrative imperative, narrative function, knowledge gaps, dialectical order, and South Park. Yes, that South Park. J just trust me on this. I'll explain it when we get there. Like and subscribe, I guess. The backstory leading up to Ragnarok is long, complicated, and, well, awesome. But to reduce it down to its base elements, here's all you need to know. Kratos, a general in the Spartan army, pledges his immortal soul to the Greek god of war Ares for the power to defeat his enemies. He is granted this power in the form of the Blades of Chaos, a pair of chain swords that are seared into Kratos' forearms, a symbolic representation of his eternal servitude. In an effort to make Kratos the ultimate warrior, Ares tricks Kratos into murdering his wife and daughter, whose ashes are then grafted onto his skin, earning him the infamous nickname, the Ghost of Sparta. Kratos takes his revenge on Ares and becomes the new god of war, but unable to let his rage go, takes down the entire Greek pantheon over the course of three games. With each fresh deicide, a new calamity falls upon the citizens of ancient Greece, committing the entire civilization to ruin until only Zeus remains. Kratos kills him too, even after learning that Zeus is his father. Then, with no one left to exact revenge, in Japan, Kratos exacts upon himself, or so it would seem. God of War 4, the 2018 reboot, picks up centuries later and... Cut that out! Cut that out! Listen, do we have to play this music? Is this what you want? No offense to Barry McCreary, he made a soundtrack for the ages, but every single YouTube video about God of War 4 plays the same music, and, and, and I, and I, uh, I just can't. How about... This. That's much better. Now, where were we? God of War 4 picks up centuries later and swaps out ancient Greece for Scandinavia. Kratos, much older and now the father of Atreus, chops down a tree marked with a golden handprint by his recently deceased wife Faye. Her two dying wishes were that they would chop down all the marked trees for her funeral pyre and to spread her ashes from the peak of the highest mountain in all the Nine Realms. What follows is a fairly simple story about gods and men, parents and children, though that simplicity reveals a lot of depth on closer examination. Watching Kratos transform from someone so ashamed of his past that he's afraid to embrace his own child to a loving father that's finally open and honest with himself is powerful. This is thanks in no small part to a limited cast of characters that each add context and meaning to the psychological journey that Kratos goes through. There's Freya, ex-wife of Odin, and mother to Baldur. Freya loves Baldur so much that she tries to shield him from all harm with a magical spell, which in turn curses him to an existence devoid of feeling. Freya, seeing that revenge is the only thing that would make her son happy, freely offers her life to Baldur, though Kratos 
puts an end to that. They represent what would happen if Kratos were to be overly protective of Atreus and not let him grow into his own person. Then there's Magni and Modi, sons of Thor who clearly were not raised with anything remotely resembling affection. They represent what Atreus could be if Kratos were to remain the harsh, affectionless father he is at the start of the game. Kratos must strike the right balance between these two extremes in order to show his son that he is loved, but not shielding him from the world. And I think God of War 4 pulls it off beautifully. And a giant snake fights a resurrected dead giant. I mean, what's not to love? Which brings us to God of War Ragnarok. I'm gonna skip over a lot in this recap because while many events do occur in this game, to be perfectly honest, a lot of it is disposable. Like this guy. You know who this guy is? We don't need to talk about this guy, because he serves no narrative function. He's just there to take up screen time, which sadly is a criticism that applies to a lot of God of War Ragnarok. God of War Ragnarok opens with Thimble Winter, the years-long blizzard that precedes Ragnarok in full swing. Kratos looks at the pouch that held Faye's ashes in the first game. Atreus walks in with a deer, a clear callback to his inability to hunt one at the beginning of God of War 4, which, sure, I'd hope he could bag a deer by now. Then, on their way home, they're attacked by Freya. As mentioned before, Kratos killed her son Baldur at the climax of God of War 4 to save her own life. He does so knowing that revenge cannot lead to fulfillment. This path you walk, vengeance, you will find no peace, I know. And, as he would have had to fight Baldur to the death regardless, he'd rather get it done now while Freya, whom he considers a friend, is still alive in this world. Freya, understandably, swore revenge against Kratos for murdering her child, but the specific reason why she attacks at the start of God of War Ragnarok is... Because... Later dialogue reveals that Freya has attacked Kratos and Atreus repeatedly over the three years between games. This is just the latest failed attempt on Kratos' life, who refuses to fight back because, again, he considers Freya a friend. Questionable choices there. At home, Atreus puts his sick wolf Fenrir down, which is sad because dogs, and goes off to bury the body. Kratos dreams about his late wife Faye, which is a very unnecessary scene, no matter how much I love Deborah Ann Wolf. And I do love... Deborah Ann Wolf. When Kratos wakes up, he finds Atreus is yet to return from burying Fenrir. Kratos goes looking for him, discovers that a bear knocked down one of their magical trees of protection, fights the bear, and oh my gosh, it's Atreus! I like this scene. I was genuinely shocked that Kratos was beating his own son to a pulp. I mean, look at the pain on that bear's face. And this seems to set up the central conflict. Kratos' isolationism versus Atreus' wish to get involved. To some extent, this kind of is the central conflict, but we'll dive into that spaghetti mess much later. Atreus then marks a new tree of protection, and they head back home where the story begins in earnest as Thor and Odin arrive at Kratos' doorstep. Another callback to God of War 4 and Baldur's visit. Odin makes Kratos an offer. Absolution for killing Magni, Modi, and Baldur. A peace treaty to prevent Ragnarok. And he'll even stop Freya's attacks to help sweeten the pot. In return, Atreus must stop searching for the Norse God of War, Tyr, who was believed dead in the previous game. Kratos, clearly surprised that Atreus had been hiding something from him, rejects Odin's offer. Odin takes it in stride. Thor and Kratos fight to a stalemate, which is admittedly really fucking rad. And it's also kind of funny how they argue over parenting methods since Magni and Modi were terrible human, terrible godly beings. Modi sought out in fear of you. He died of the wounds you gave him. Oh, we got a model father here. This gives Odin the opportunity to speak to Atreus alone and off-camera, which is a choice. If you think it's weird that such an important conversation would happen off-screen, this is due to the unbroken one-shot cinematic style of the Norse saga God of Wars. There are no cutaways, transitions, or breaks. It's one long, unbroken take like those scenes in Children of Men or Kill Bill. We can't see what Atreus and Odin are talking about because we're busy swapping parenting tips with Thor. This didn't bother me in God of War 4 because our two protagonists, Kratos and Atreus, were together for most of the runtime, and Atreus was comatose when they were split up. Nothing happened on his end that Kratos would need to be aware of. A big twist in Ragnarok is that Atreus is a playable character for like half the game. Mechanically, that's all well and good. Atreus's more agile, long-range focused moveset is a refreshing change of pace compared to the much slower, stodgier Kratos. I also love his Max Payne-style bullet time dives. I did that over and over just to do it. It was fun. 
but in respect to story structure, this is a big problem, as one side of the story will either come to a halt as we play out the other side, or important conversations will take place off screen, like Odin and Atreus in the opening, or much later when Atreus becomes friends with Thor's daughter Thrud, and he, off screen mind you, tries to convince her how manipulative and cruel her grandfather Odin is. They casually pick this conversation thread back up while controlling Atreus, with Thrud saying she's not convinced by his accusations, and doesn't that sound like a conversation that we, the audience, should have been a part of? I sure would have liked to have seen how Thrud reacted when Atreus told her the Patriarch of Asgard was considered a war criminal in the other eight realms. Maybe this was an optional conversation you could have while controlling Atreus, and if it was, I missed it. But I also consider optional conversations as separate from the main narrative. Narrative, if they were important, then they wouldn't have been optional, right? When Kratos returns home, he confronts Atreus about hiding things from him, but agrees to follow Atreus to the dwarven realm of Svartalheim, where he believes Tyr is imprisoned. Thus concludes the opening sequence of God of War Ragnarok, which brings me to my first issue, the narrative imperative, which, besides sounding like an Andy Dwyer band name, boils down to one essential question. Why does this story have to happen to this character in this moment? The choice of when to begin a story should not be an arbitrary one. Rather, it ought to be tied to the specifics of the protagonist's original state of being. It is at this moment, not a month ago, not a year from now, but right now when their story begins. In God of War 4, the answer to the narrative imperative is very simple, because Kratos chops down the last tree marked with his wife's handprint, which is literally the first act in the game. It's later revealed that the trees created an illusion of sorts that hid Kratos' presence from the Norse gods, which is why Baldur comes knocking on their door shortly afterwards. There's a very direct line from chopping down a tree to Baldur arriving at their house. Now, for God of War Ragnarok, there's a couple answers you might give for the narrative imperative such as because Ragnarok's about to start. Fimble Winter's been going on for three years after all, so Ragnarok must surely be around the corner, right? But no. The way Ragnarok works in this story is it will only start when those involved choose to start it. Odin himself says as much when he proposes peace. How does peace strike the esteemed, retired god of war? How about we just don't kill each other? How about you stay home, kick up your feet, seek no quarrel with me? and I'll have none with you. Had everyone decided to stay home, like Odin suggests, Ragnarok would never begin. I I I'm sure someone can point out, oh, not true, fate would interfere to start Ragnarok anyway. And they're apparently 80 fucking years old. And yes, I get that, but also, that's not the choice the writers made. They chose to set it up so that Ragnarok only begins when the Horn of Gjallarhorn, it's very hard to pronounce, the Horn of Gjallarhorn is blown, which would only happen if someone took it from Heimdall, as he works from Odin and he's not going to blow it otherwise. So, no. It's not because Ragnarok's about to start. What about because Odin and Thor arrive at Kratos' house? Now, this is a bit better of a guess, but let me ask you this. Why do Odin and Thor arrive at Kratos' house in this moment? So let's go back to that tree Atreus mark because something really bothers me about it. Kratos and Atreus continue to mark trees with golden handprints in this game, but why? They don't create an illusion anymore, not really, since the Norse gods already know of their existence and know exactly where they live. Unlike Baldur, who only arrived after the last tree was cut down and therefore became aware of their presence, Odin and Thor come a-calling regardless. Atreus even points this out. We haven't seen the last of Odin or Thor. And clearly they can just walk in and blast holes in our home whenever they want. I think the real reason for this scene is because the hand-painted trees were such an iconic image from the first game, they had to be referenced to in the second game, which is just not a good reason to put anything in your story. So if Odin and Thor don't arrive because the magical barrier is broken, then why do they? I got it, because Atreus turned into a bear. While turning into a bear does symbolize Atreus' inability to control his own emotions, and he did knock over a magic tree while in bear form, 
arm, we just established that the trees weren't all that effective at keeping Odin and Thor away. And unless I missed it, Atreus' ability to shapeshift never really factors into any of his interactions with Odin throughout the script. So no, it's not because Atreus turns into a bear. The answer to the narrative imperative that kicks off the entire story of God of War Ragnarok is because... Like Freya's random attack before it, there's no direct action that Kratos or Atreus take to cause Odin and Thor to visit, which is when the alarm bells started to go off in my head. Events were happening, but unlike the excellent setup for God of War 4, they weren't happening for concrete reasons. This concerned me. To skip ahead a bit, Kratos and Atreus do find Tyr, the imprisoned Norse god of war, though long years of torture at Odin's hand made him lose the taste for battle. He's a sworn pacifist, refuses to lead an army into Ragnarok, and has no answers for Atreus on what to do next. The team return to the Holger brothers, Brock and Sindri's house. Brock and Sindri are a pair of dwarven blacksmiths who, in God of War 4, used to work together but separated due to their vastly different personalities. Even though he's a slovenly liberal and I'm a fastidious conservative. I smell a sitcom! Sindri is an uptight germaphobe, Brock as crass as it gets. But over the course of God of War 4, they realize they're able to accomplish much more together than apart, and that they just plain miss each other's company. It's, it, it's nice. Brock and Sindri are essentially glorified upgrade menus that provide the occasional knick-knack or doodad to help move the story along, like a quiver of arrows made from mistletoe that become much more significant later in the story. While I never really laughed at any of Brock and Sindri's jokes, I also didn't mind them. Though, I guess Sony Santa Monica Studios loved Brock enough to refer to him as the family dog, which we'll get to. At Brock and Sindri's, the group contemplate their next steps as they don't have a clear idea of what to do next. Which brings me to my next issue I have with God of War Ragnarok, South Park. Okay, so the concept really isn't South Park, but a method of storytelling that Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the creators of South Park, utilize. We found out this really simple rule that maybe you guys have all heard before, but we can take these beats, which are basically the beats of your outline, and if the words and then belong between those beats, you're f***ed. What should happen between every beat that you've written down is either the word therefore or but. You come up with an idea and it's like, okay, this happens, right? And then this happens. No, 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 it should be this happens and therefore this happens. But this happens, therefore this happens. Put more formally, this is the single cause and event pathway, which is A leads to B, which leads to C, and so on all the way to Z. This is the spine of the story. And if you don't have a spine, or you have too many spines, your story will fall apart. Let's examine God of War 4's opening sequence real quick. Kratos chops down a tree. Therefore, he creates a funeral pyre for his late wife to carry her ashes to the highest mountain. But he is afraid his son is too weak for the journey. Therefore, he makes Atreus hunt a deer to prove his mettle. But a troll takes the deer. Therefore, they fight the troll. But Atreus flies into an uncontrollable raid. Therefore, Kratos says he's not ready and they go home. But Baldur shows up. Therefore, Kratos says they must take the journey whether Atreus is ready or not. Not. Thought I wasn't ready. You are not. We have no choice now. So you see how that's one long, unbroken pathway of cause and effects, all stemming from the first action of chopping down a tree. Now, let's take a look at God of War Ragnarok's opening sequence. Kratos sits in a cave, and then Atreus comes in with a deer. Therefore, they go home, and then Freya attacks, and then Atreus puts Fenrir down. Therefore, he goes off to bury the body, and then Kratos goes to sleep. Therefore, he has a dream about Fae, and then Kratos wakes up to find Atreus isn't home yet. Therefore, he goes out to search for him, but is attacked by a bear. Therefore, he fights the bear, but the bear turns out to be Atreus. Therefore, Kratos says they will take no risks and they return home. And then, Odin and Thor arrive to offer peace, but Kratos says no. Therefore, Thor attacks Kratos. And then, Kratos comes home. Therefore, he confronts Atreus about keeping secrets. And then, Kratos and Atreus go off to find Tyr. 
that last one could be a but if I was feeling generous. When you break it down like that, it's no wonder I really like the fight with Bear Treus, because it's the only sequence in the opening that is an unbroken cause and effect pathway. The rest is a series of and thens, with the occasional therefore or but sprinkled throughout. And believe me when I say this, that the entire game is structured this way. The lack of unbroken cause and effect pathways makes God of War Ragnarok's plot feel disconnected and unmotivated. Like when Atreus lies down to sleep and then, through absolutely no action of his own, is magically transported to Ironwood, the secret hiding place of the giants. What? Quick aside, I actually didn't mind the Ironwood sequence like a lot of other people. I like that Angerboda uses bright, colorful paints to fight monsters with, and that Atreus gets to hang out with another person his own age for once. And I, I think the main reason I like Ironwood is because it follows a single cause and effect pathway. One where Atreus learns his father is destined to die, but can't handle the revelation, therefore he turns into a raging wolf, but with the help of Angerboda he learns learns to control his emotions. Therefore, he is now able to shapeshift at will. It's really neat. I like it. I, I, I didn't think it was bad. At one point, I wondered when the actual story would begin, took a look at my save file, and saw that I had been playing for 15 hours already! 15 hours of and thens, of disconnected sequences, capped by returning to Sindri's house, of an endless parade of side characters who have very little to no narrative function like Ingrid. Do you know who Ingrid is? Ingrid is a sword that hangs out in Odin's office. Odin gives Atreus the sword, which kind of has a Disney animal sidekick vibe that whistles and hoots to communicate, and yeah, Ingrid's kind of cool, I guess. Then, when Atreus decides to return home and not help Odin after all, which Odin accepts with zero pushback, by the way, Atreus gives Ingrid back. Now, the way Odin disdainfully cast Ingrid aside, I thought, surely something will come of this Chekhov gunsword, right? But no. Once Ragnarok begins, Freya's brother Freyr calls Ingrid out of the sky. Turns out it's his sword, and yahoo's off with it. Until he comes back to die a hero's death. And that's it. That is the story of Ingrid. Why was Ingrid in this game? Why was it a companion with a personality? Why did they give Atreus the sword, only to have Freyr use it? What was the narrative function of the sword? Narrative function means each character in a screenplay must have a reason for existing within that story universe. Each has to contribute to the advancement of the plot. Each has to play a role supporting the protagonist's physical and psychological journey. On that note, what's the narrative function of Freya's brother Freyr? In the lead-up to his introduction, our party bickers over the kind of person Freyr was. A drunk, a womanizer, an all-around person of low moral fiber. Then we're introduced to Freyr and he's the leader of a resistance group made up of several races of the Nine Realms, some of which should hate each other. He's been leading them for years. Freyr's a responsible person and just remains that way for the rest of the story. No flaws to overcome, no real divide to heal between himself and Freya. His heroic death isn't even that out of left field because, yeah, the leader of a resistance should die for his cause. So what narrative function did Freya or Ingrid serve? Were they solely a means to warp everyone to safety at the end? What insight did they bring to Kratos and Atreus' journey? What even is Kratos and Atreus' journey, which more on that later. When Atreus comes back from Ironwood, Kratos angrily tells him he's been gone for two days. What were you thinking? I... I wanted to visit Fenrir. For two days? I... Do not lie to me again! And then Freya attacks. When she gets the upper hand, Atreus bears down on Freya, but Kratos stops him from mauling her, which for some reason makes her finally give up her quest for vengeance on one condition, that Kratos help break Odin's hold over her. While they take care of that, let's talk about Freya. Yes, Freya whose son you killed in God of War 4, and who swore the nastiest revenge she could imagine. I will parade your cold body from every corner of every realm and feed your soul to the vilest filth in hell that is 
my promise! And while I'm not at all against the idea of Freya reconciling her differences with Kratos, I love it in fact. I have a major issue with how and how quickly this is achieved. To go back to their battle, Freya's 180 seems to be instigated by Atreus changing into a bear and Kratos defending her. But I don't really see how this would change the way Freya feels towards Kratos, though to be fair, she remains on that fence for a while. There's still a part of me that is so angry. It'll always be... It'll always be angry! But for all intents and purposes, Kratos and Freya have buried the hatchet, and now work towards a somewhat common goal, as Freya pushes for Kratos to be their general in Ragnarok, which is an idea Atreus also has floated. Stop thinking like a father for a moment and start thinking like a general! No! However, Freya's change doesn't come about through any real direct action other than Atreus' despair at his dad being in immediate danger. The story itself even provides a better opportunity for when Freya should have had that change of heart. Now, I'm gonna do something which I don't enjoy, which is to suggest how the story could have been better. In bird culture, this is considered a dick move. It's not great writer's etiquette to make suggestions on how a work should have been written, as I was not in the writer's room. I didn't experience the hardships the writers went through, tough decisions that they had to make, or even if they already came up with the idea I'm about to suggest, but had to cut it for various reasons. Writing on its own is already extremely difficult. Writing for a game? I, I, I can't imagine. Although Rocksteady, if you do want to hire me from that interview years ago, I'm still available. All that aside, I think Freya should have had her change of heart during the sequence where Kratos searches for the Norns, or the Norse mythology equivalent of the Sisters of Fate. Kratos seeks them out so he can ask where Atreus is after he ran away to Asgard, which we'll get to. The Norns basically tell him he's an Asgard dummy, you already knew that. I, I seek, seek my, my son! son. <laughs> You know the child is an Asgard. Which, yeah, Kratos already suspected it, so this sequence feels pretty superfluous as is. You can easily swap out the reason why Kratos wants to talk to the Norns. So, if we're moving this sequence up in the timeline, let's just say Kratos and Atreus want some direction on how to stop Ragnarok because, let's face it, they don't have one. As a quick aside, this scene is blocked out like a stage play and makes multiple direct references to storytelling, which admittedly I really dug. I like when works of fiction contain their own fictional works that work as a commentary on the nature of fiction itself. And I am running bear, betrothed to Pocahontas in the play. 20 grand for summer camp. He's Mr. Woo Woo. And this scene doesn't do a bad job, though it does have this weird blocking beat. Your prophecy said he would die. That's also in one of Odin's scenes. Of course he means to betray me, huh? Heimdall. And both times it felt awkward. My guess is these beats weren't written, but that the actors came up with it in the moment, not aware they were making the same visual gag twice. The Nords are oracles of sorts, but they also like to play head games. While searching for them, Kratos and Freya are confronted with hallucinations of their deepest fears. Kratos imagines that Atreus views him as a monster and runs to Odin for protection. Freya sees a vision of snapping Baldur's neck with her own hands. This informs us that deep down, Freya understands she's ultimately responsible for Baldur's death. While it's a good scene on its own, given where it falls in the storyline, it doesn't hold as much dramatic weight as it could have, because Freya and Kratos have already made peace with one another. You could argue that the inclusion of this scene explains Freya's change of heart at the end of her boss battle, but I'd counter this isn't the best way to go about doing so. There's an anecdote I like about Finding Nemo that I think applies here. Finding Nemo opens with the protagonist Marlin losing his wife and children to a barracuda save for one lone egg that he names Nemo. This explains why Marlin is so overly protective of Nemo at the beginning of the film, except the movie didn't always start this way. Originally, the barracuda scene came halfway through the film, providing insight into Marlin's 
behavior, but this didn't work with test audiences. After spending half a movie with an unlikable protagonist, they continued to not like Marlon, Barracuda scene or no. Pixar decided to move the Barracuda scene to the opening of the film and boom, problem solved. Audiences immediately empathized with Marlon and were on board for the ride. So even if the scene of Freya killing Balder is an attempt to explain why she drops her quest for vengeance against Kratos, I maintain that similar to Marlin and the Barracuda, the scene occurs at the wrong moment. The Norn sequence should have occurred sooner, while Freya still lusted for vengeance. Her boss fight could have been during this sequence instead of and thening out of nowhere, and wouldn't it have been neat to fight her while hallucinating Kratos and Freya's innermost fears? I think so. At the end of the fight, Freya could then be confronted with the vision of killing Balder, and this breaks her. Haunted by the truth that lies within her own heart, Freya finally relents and gives up on her quest for vengeance against Kratos. Doesn't that sound a little bit better than, because Atreus turns into a bear? Anyway, what's the real reason for Freya's change of heart? So what if we can figure out a way to align them where it's like, I know this, I took this from you, but we're really going in the same direction. Let's go get this guy. And that's where all of this, the connections started to come together for us. Where you're like, okay, but if we would, again, you have to earn that. And you know, it's, it's tricky because we wanted to get her back soon, but not too soon. And for some people, it's too, still too soon. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost impossible to like thread that needle. This is Eric Williams, the director of God of War Ragnarok and someone who's been involved with the franchise for most of his existence. I want to make this crystal clear. He seems like a nice guy, and I'm sure he's super smart. You don't get to be the director of a franchise as huge of God of War just because you've been there the longest, or, or at least I hope not. So I don't want to come across as mean or dismissive when I say, having Freya drop her burning desire for revenge so quickly because the developers wanted her to be a companion character is bad story structure. Especially when, if they had just delayed her turn by a little bit longer, they could have pulled it off beautifully with beats that are already established. Sony, if you want to hire me as a story editor, I'm available and believe you me, I'm dirt cheap. When Freya and Kratos return from releasing Odin's hold over her, Kratos demands to know where Atreus was for those two days he was with Angerboda. Where did you go? What did you see? Atreus won't tell him due to a promise he made to her. Tell no one about Ironwood out of fear of Odin and Thor finding out where it is and completing their giant genocide. My problem with this scene is that it is an artificial conflict. Atreus doesn't have a real reason for hiding the truth from his dad, and his insistence that Kratos trust him without any knowledge of where he was or what he did. It's my future, it's my life. You are my son. Then why don't you trust me? If you want me to trust you, then tell me the truth. The truth is you're being a complete asshole. Sigmund! Is a very, very big ask of the audience, which brings me to another issue with God of War Ragnarok, knowledge gaps, or the mechanism by which writers deliver a story in subtext. A well-crafted story continually invites us to project from the current given state to some future state that we would like to see. In other words, knowledge gaps make the audience try to guess ahead at where the story is going. Audience members do this constantly, and it's the writer's job to either A, keep us guessing, B, give us what we want, or C, give us something better. There are two kinds of knowledge gaps. They are revelation, when a character knows more than the audience and the audience must catch up, and privilege, when the audience knows more than a character and anticipate the character finding out, also known as dramatic irony. God of War 4 has several good examples examples of privileged knowledge gaps. Kratos knows he's a god, but won't tell Atreus, saying it's to protect his son from a hard life of deicide. That means Atreus is a god who believes himself to be immortal, and that dual nature tears at itself, resulting in the mysterious sickness that makes Atreus frail and weak. We, the audience, look forward to the moment when Kratos tells Atreus the truth, and closes the privileged knowledge gap, which several characters urge Kratos to do for the sake of his son. He doesn't know, does he? about your true nature, or his own. That is none of your concern. The longer you wait to tell him his true nature, the more damage you do. He will resent you, and you may lose him forever. There is much about me I would not have him know. Huh? So you value your privacy more than your son, Nick. 
though it conflicts with Kratos' desire to hide his shame, symbolized by the bandages on his forearms that conceal his scars. After telling Atreus about their godhood, Kratos still hides the fact he killed an entire civilization and slaughtered his own father. Atreus' behavior instantly becomes more reckless and aggressive, as he now believes himself above reproach and correct in all actions. I said no. But we're gods. We can do whatever we want. We now anticipate the closing of this new knowledge gap, which comes at the very end of the story and directly ties into Kratos no longer hiding who he once was as he removes the bandages in full light of day and reveals his scars. Wow, is that powerful stuff. In God of War Ragnarok, Kratos is fated to die. Kratos already knows this as he learned it at the end of God of War 4. Atreus also learns this not too far into his own side of the story. The audience now waits for Kratos and Atreus to talk about his fate and anticipate what will happen when they close this privileged knowledge gap. Except they don't. They continue to protect the other from knowledge that they both possess, but they just won't talk about it. This runs the risk of the audience losing interest in closing the gap. I know I sure did. The film critic, film crit Hulk, refers to this kind of secret keeping as refusing to play your hand, waiting for the quote unquote right moment to play your favorite narrative card. But in reality, this grinds your story to a halt. The better play is to go all in and use the cards that you have, which forces you to come up with new ideas that will move the story forward. In God of War 4, Kratos hides his godhood from his son. Then, when he finally reveals it, their relationship moves in a new, more tenuous direction as he hides the full truth of his violent past. But the important thing is that the relationship moved forward. In God of War Ragnarok, Kratos and Atreus' relationship remains static for the majority of the game. Stop thinking like a father for a moment and start thinking like a general. No! One hour later. Just trust me, you'll want to. Trust! Five hours later. But I just need you to trust me. You kept secrets, but I trust you. That's not the same. Approximately 10 hours later. He doesn't have any faith in me. It's fine if he keeps secrets. It's fine if mom did. That is not fine. And when it does move forward, it's not because the characters have closed any knowledge gaps. It's because it's time to move on now. Kratos accuses Atreus of going to Asgard to meet with Odin, which makes Atreus go to Asgard and meet with Odin. Only not before throwing a fit, morphing into a bear, and mauling Sindri on his way out. Millennials. Despite the bear rampage and Sindri splash damage, I still call this an artificial conflict. It's only here to get Atreus to Asgard, where he meets Heimdall, Odin's son, and a complete dick, who has the ability to read people's minds. He sees the prophecy that Asgard will fall in Atreus's head, and so he picks a fight. This fight is really cool because you can't lay a single finger on Heimdall no matter what you do. He can read minds after all, so he dodges everything perfectly until Odin and Thor intervene. Take one more step, you're not gonna like how this ends. Heimdall continues to be an insufferable prick until the long-awaited moment when you get to take him on as Kratos. During a much later sequence, Heimdall attacks Kratos out of nowhere. Kratos gives the little shit multiple chances to back down, but Heimdall refuses. Kratos knows that fighting Heimdall marks the beginning of Ragnarok, something he wishes to avoid because of his fated death. But Kratos also knows Heimdall means to kill Atreus. A fight is inevitable, and we finally get to see how Kratos will utilize the drop spear, a weapon forged by Brock specifically to fight Heimdall with that's capable of making infinite copies of itself. Kratos utilizes the spear by throwing it at Heimdall, who snatches it out of the air like an arrow, and Kratos explodes it in his hands. The god that can read minds can't read that Kratos plans to explode the very spear he's holding in his hands. Or you can just huck a bunch of spears at the floor and explode them at his feet, but either way, uh, it, 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 it's not good. It's, it's just not satisfying. Taking down the skyscraper-sized Kronos was more believable than this. This still only stuns Heimdall, who's able to dodge Kratos' attacks until Kratos swings really hard this time and lands the first blow. So in the Heimdall fight, it goes like one, two, three, and then you finally clip him with the, with the right hand. But he hits him, he clips him with the ring, that's what leaves that cut. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So even when he finally lands a punch, it's with Dropnir that he lands that cuts his cheek. Okay. 
After gaining the upper hand, Kratos gives Heimdall one last chance to walk away. Heimdall responds by threatening Atreus again, so Kratos takes things to their inevitable conclusion. Yet, killing Heimdall is treated like a Dark Knight of the Soul moment for Kratos, signaling a backslide into his god-murdering, civilization-destroying ways, and I, I just don't buy it. He's a father protecting his son, full stop. While there are multiple references to Kratos reverting back to his old ways in order to protect Atreus, it's quite clear that Kratos is no longer the god-slaughtering civilization destroyer he once was, and hasn't been since God of War 4. He no longer goes out of his way to seek a fight, and usually only acts in self-defense or to protect his friends and family. Of course, that could change were Atreus to be killed or if Kratos needed to murder every last motherfucker in the room to prevent that from happening, but in this specific moment, Kratos has every justifiable reason to kill Heimdall, and let's be honest with ourselves, we want Heimdall to die. This is what we signed up for. This is why we play God of War. Also, how is this or this different from this? All three are Kratos killing a god, all three are in self-defense or to protect others, yet only one is treated like a Dark Knight of the Soul moment. But seriously though, fuck Heimdall. Back at Asgard, Atreus meets Thor's daughter Thrude, who introduces herself by holding a meat cleaver to Atreus' chest and accuses him of killing her brother Modi, which, to be fair, he did, then saying, it's all good, they're better off without Modi, and they become fast friends. So, no conflict there. All right then. Atreus learns that Odin wants to assemble the pieces of an ancient mask in order to see into creation itself and obtain infinite knowledge. Atreus, a half-giant on his mother's side, travels with Thor, known giant killer who definitely wants to kill Atreus to find a piece of the mask. They find it without incident, beyond Thor letting Atreus know he still really wants to kill him, so kind of an unmotivated sequence altogether. Drama is conflict, after all, but conflict doesn't mean one person holding a weapon to another person's chest, like Thor and Thrude do in this sequence. Conflict means two characters want something, Give him the whip. Throw me the idol. but only one can get it. No time to argue. Throw me the idol. I throw you the whip. Give me the whip. Adios, señor. What does Thrude want in her scene with Atreus? She doesn't want anything, it seems. What does Thor want when he hits Atreus with Mjolnir? To be a bully? And what does Atreus want? To not die? Those aren't real wants, so there's no real conflict. And if there's no conflict, I'll let you do the math. Skipping way ahead, Atreus and Thor do eventually find all the pieces of the mask, except for when Thor's getting drunk at the bar and confronted by Thrude in a scene that, frankly, made me feel nothing. Yes, there's an actual conflict here. Atreus and Thrude want Thor to leave the bar. Thor doesn't want to leave the bar. Great. Check conflict off the list. We got it. But very little in this story has led to Thrude's frustration with her dad slipping back into alcoholism. We know she's frustrated because that's what she's saying out loud with her words, and we can even sympathize with her because we're not monsters. But the lack of buildup towards this moment ultimately makes it feel unearned. Thor's alcoholism is referenced, like sniffing the meat at Kratos' house and Odin making light of Thor's sobriety. You are no fun anymore. Yet Thor and Thrude share very little screen time before this scene in the bar, so we don't have a sense of where their relationship is at at the beginning of the game, how that's tested by the events in the story, why exactly Thor falls off the wagon in this moment, because it's pretty unclear. Honestly, I liked you better as a drunk. Yes, you can infer all of these things during this scene because we've watched stories our whole lives and can fill in the dots, but personally, I'd much rather have spent more time building up to this confrontation between Thor and Thrude than introducing yet another side character that adds very little to the overall narrative. Thor sobers up and goes with Atreus to find the last mask piece. They do, and Odin arrives immediately after to claim it. Thor's wife, Sif, gosh, have I not introduced Sif yet? Never mind, not important also arrives claiming she has proof, off-screen proof the audience isn't privileged to, that Kratos killed Heimdall, and she's come to collect the bill owed for the death of her sons. Odin denies her request and tells her to get lost. 
Sif then appeals to Thor, hearkening back to when their boys were babies, the, uh, the same boy he beat the tar out of in God of War 4, and Thor finally works up enough gumption to murder Atreus, who warps out of there thanks to an orb Sindri had given to him immediately before this sequence. Yeah. Eric Williams? I know what you did here, Eric Williams. You wrote yourself into a corner. It's like that saying, you painted yourself into a corner where you, you paint and you paint and you paint, not paying attention to where you are in the room and suddenly you're in a corner on the opposite side of the door with nowhere to go. Try to leave the room and you'll ruin all your hard work. Writers can do this too. They can write themselves into a corner, which is what Eric Williams did here and I'll tell you how it happened. They had this sequence in mind. Atreus and Thor find the last mask piece. Sif confronts Atreus. Thor finally makes good on his intentions towards Atreus. They wrote this scene out, they loved it, and then realization slowly dawned on them and they had to admit to themselves, how the hell do we get Atreus out of this mess? I guarantee the writers sat in silence trying to figure out a natural, organic solution to safely extract Atreus from the situation that they themselves had put him into. Until enough frustration boiled up under this problem pot's lid and one person defeatedly exclaimed, Fuck it! Just have Sindri give him some doodad that warps him right out of there! I know this is what happened because I've been in that same corner. Compare this to the mistletoe arrows in God of War 4. Early on, Sindri gifts Atreus with a quiver of mistletoe arrows, but they're treated almost like a throwaway. Later, Kratos uses one of the arrowheads to mend a loose strap on Atreus' quiver, which is also a tender moment between father and son. Dual purpose scenes. I love those. Freya then burns the arrows, knowing they'll dispel the magic that protects Baldur. But we, the audience, don't know this yet unless you've read Norse mythology, but the scene works either way as it's an uncharacteristic moment for Freya, who has been nothing but warm and welcoming to our heroes up to this point. Finally, at the climax, the arrowhead pierces Baldur's hand when he punches Atreus, which breaks Freya's protective spell and allows Baldur to be killed. The writers carefully set the arrows up, reintroduce them throughout the script, then pay them off at the right moment, rather than handing Atreus the arrows immediately before they're required, like some Legend of Zelda light arrows in the last dungeon. Back at Sindri's, complete mask in hand, the crew discuss next steps. Tyr pulls a Boromir and urges they use the mask to gain knowledge on how to stop the prophecy. Kratos says shortcuts always have consequences, and Atreus says it's worth the chance if it means no one has to die. But here's the thing. No one has a clue what the mask does, or what it will accomplish, or if it will even work. Atreus only wants the mask because Odin wants it, therefore they must not let him have it. Atreus also wants the mask because he wants to gain the knowledge on how to prevent his father's death, but again, we're not even sure the mask can do that, neither is Atreus. Structuring Atreus' story around the mask isn't inherently a bad choice, but when we're almost at the end of the game without a clear idea of what the mask is even capable of, it makes the whole storyline feel vague and unmotivated. Tyr renounces his vow of peace and declares he will take up his spear one last time to lead them all into Asgard, using a secret path only he knows of. Everyone's on board with the idea except for Brock, who wants to know the finer details of Tyr's plan, why he's suddenly so eager to fight, and why he's calling Atreus Loki. And then, in the and then to and then them all, Tyr stabs Brock <gasps> and is revealed to have been Odin oh my God. the whole time. The whole time? You would f the whole time! He disappears before Kratos can hurl a spear through him, but the spear catches the mask out of Odin's hand. Brock dies, Sindri's devastated, and Kratos and Atreus decide to return home and hunt for deer. To return to knowledge gaps, this would be a revelation knowledge gap in that Odin knows he's Tyr, but no one else does, including the audience. Eric Williams admits this moment was largely influenced by the Sixth Sense big twist at the end. Once we got there, we're like, okay, we're gonna do the, the mystery, right? We're gonna do the Sixth Sense thing, like where you don't know until you know. So let's quickly examine the Sixth Sense. Bruce Willis is a child psychologist who is shot by one of his former patients. Years later, he meets Haley Joel Osment, a child who sees dead people. 
Willis helps Osmond come to terms with his abilities, which allows Osmond to help both ghosts and their loved ones move on. Their work together done, Osmond offhandedly suggests that Willis talk to his estranged wife in her sleep. As Willis does so, she drops his wedding ring from her hand and all the pieces slide into place. Bruce Willis is dead, which of course Haley Joel Osmond knew the whole time. The closing of this revelation knowledge gap allows Willis to tell his wife she'll be okay, to let go of her, and to move on into the afterlife. Why this moment works so well, and really, why a lot of M. Night Shyamalan's other big twists don't, is because the twist is woven into the protagonist's journey. It shocks the audience, yes, but it also completes Willis's character arc. The Odin as Tear twist does not hit on multiple levels like the Sixth Sense. Yes, it is shocking that Brock dies, and Kratos does realize Atreus can't just hide in the woods like he would prefer. However, this scene is similar to Thrude confronting Thor over his alcoholism in that it doesn't feel like the story had built up to this moment, no matter how many visual cues hinted that Odin is Tear. Even if you go back to where you rescued him, if you go into that chamber, there's raven feathers in the corner. Oh. There's all kinds of little stuff like like dotted throughout. When you're boating into Svartalheim for the first time, right before the siren goes off, there's a little dwarf on a bridge and he spits over the bridge. <laughs> I saw that. That's Odin. Okay. You see, Odin's really into cooking. Yo, those better not be mushrooms I smell. That looks good. Is that braised? And one of the first things he does as Tear is offer to cook for everyone because he can't stand the food Brock makes. It was obvious the whole time! Simply put, Brock dies because now is the time to feel sad about Brock dying. He gave me like three things that had to be done. Like, what are the three things? He's like, well, Ragnarok's gonna happen, the kid's gotta leave, and Brock's gotta die. He goes, do you know why Brock needs to die? I said, yeah, I remember we talked about this a long time ago, that he's the family dog. What's his beef with Brock? <laughs> he's the family dog, as we say. So that's what's gonna hurt the most. Brock was the family dog. That was the inspiration. Oh, oh God. that is okay. evil, man. <laughs> that's, not, but that's why it hurts. Happy. Family dog, family dog. The family dog. <laughs> We understand why the characters feel the way they do, because we're sympathetic human beings and have watched stories our entire lives. But without a cast of characters who make decisions specifically designed to arrive at a certain point, Thor and Thrude, Kratos and Atreus, Odin and Brock, these all feel disconnected from everything else surrounding them. So Brock dies to make us feel sad, but he also dies to move the plot into Ragnarok. We're in this weird limbo period of Fimble Winter, and as long as nobody blows the horn, we're good. There has to be a really good reason to blow the horn. And then we give a good reason to blow the horn, right? For Brock. Because you can't lose the family dog. Obviously, you know, you're supposed to kill your darlings and all that. Was there ever um, a maybe more bloodthirsty point in the writer's room where other characters were going to kill get killed off? Okay, so uh, I, I have to pause here because you, you, you don't think that's what kill your darlings means, do you? It doesn't literally mean to kill your favorite characters. It refers to editing out your favorite part in a story no matter what if it doesn't fit with the rest of your work. It's not it's it's not a blueprint for character murder. It's 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 editing advice. You do understand that, don't you? Don't you? Kratos and Atreus apologize to Sindri, who doesn't want to hear it. Get the fuck out of my sight! And the gang decides it's time for a Ragnarokin. Kratos blows Yallerhorn. Innocents get caught in the wake because Odin put them there as deterrence, which finally convinces Sif he's bad news. Sif, of course, realized this off screen. Kratos tells Atreus to open his heart to their suffering, that Kratos was wrong to tell him to act against his nature. Kratos then fights Thor, wins, and tries to make peace. Kratos finally gets through to Thor, though Odin arrives demanding he continue the fight. Thor refuses Odin's orders. Odin kills Thor. Final boss battle. Atreus breaks the mask because Kratos trusts him enough to make the decision for himself. Final boss battle phase two. Atreus siphons Odin's soul into a marble because he can do that, don't worry about it. When Atreus puts Fenrir down at the very beginning of the game, he uses the exact same words that he uses on Odin to take out Odin's soul and put it into the marble. I found that was kind of strange because I thought Atreus like figured out how to use this power throughout the game. Turns out he knew how to do it the entire time. Haha! <laughs> An another reason I don't like it. And no one wants revenge anymore, having outgrown the need for it, except of course, for Sindri. 
And all this somehow prevents Kratos' death, though it's never really explained how. This comes down to my final issue with God of War Ragnarok, which is dialectical order, which reduces the protagonist's journey down to three little words, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. What do those mean? Well, thesis, establish a flawed character. Antithesis, confront them with their opposite. Synthesis, synthesize the two to achieve balance. God of War 4 is about Kratos, a grieving widower who is unable to connect with his son Atreus, thesis. He meets Freya, an overprotective mother, and Balder, the product of that overprotection, as well as Magni and Bodhi, two neglected and abused sons. Antithesis. Kratos must find balance between those two extremes to be the kind of father Atreus needs, which has the transformative side effect of allowing Kratos to make peace with himself for murdering his own father, Zeus. Synthesis. God of War Ragnarok is about Kratos, a man who wants to control his fate by avoiding it entirely and ordering his son to do the same. Thesis. Odin is obsessed with control. The second his own son Thor refuses to follow orders, Odin runs him through with a spear. Antithesis. At the climax, Kratos relinquishes control to Atreus, trusting his son to make the right decision, who then breaks the mask in two. Synthesis. Or is it? Back when Kratos visited the Norns, they explained that there's no such thing as predestination or fate, but only archetypes. You are the sum of your choices, nothing more. And because your choices never change, you will learn that Heimdall intends to kill your son in Asgard, and you will do what you do best. And then Ragnarok. The skies burn, the curtains fall. Kratos, being the archetypical god of war, will always react in accordance with his nature, aka flipping the fuck out. Kratos seemingly changes his archetype by deciding to fight for justice, not vengeance, and that they won't win by any means necessary, but instead will keep civilian casualties to a minimum, which is the complete opposite of where his head is at in God of War 3, and thank God for that, really. These are great lessons to learn, but as I said in regards to Heimdall, Kratos has not been who he was in God of War 3 for a while now. His nature already changed. We watched it happen in God of War 4. The scenes with Faye further drive this home as she repeats the lessons Kratos had already learned in the previous game. We must be better. Must be better. We will be better. Say the line, Bart! We must be better. Yeah! Moreover, if Kratos' arc is about learning to relinquish control, then he already did this way back at the end of the opening sequence, when Atreus asks Kratos to follow him in the search for Tyr. Kratos gives up control and never really takes it back. In a later confrontation, Kratos even says this out loud. I have tried to walk this path with you. We follow your every whim. But you don't believe in any of it. And still, I follow. Because all that matters is that you are safe. I can see the argument that Kratos has not really given up control if he only follows Atreus to protect him, and that he's become a helicopter parent like Freya was in God of War 4. If so, Odin's antithesis would be that he also doesn't allow his children to leave the nest, but for completely selfish reasons, not out of parental love. Kratos would then need to learn how to love and protect Atreus while still allowing him to grow into his own person and leave the nest. Either way, it's not made clear how this change in Kratos prevents his death, seeing as how he's still the baddest motherfucker in the land, capable of beating Thor and Odin through brute force alone, whether he chooses to finish them off or not. Sure, you can speculate that Kratos would have died because maybe Odin would have stabbed him in the back after fighting Thor, or Thrud would have killed him somehow if Kratos finished the job, or any number of guesses, but that's all they would be. Guesses. We don't really know because the story itself does not set up a dramatic conflict that forces Kratos to make a meaningful choice between remaining his old archetypical self and dying, or changing his nature and living. We're told this choice has been made. We survive today because of your choices. Who to trust? Who to call friend? There's an attempt to create a dichotomy between Kratos and Odin as Atreus chooses what to do with the mask, but it hasn't been adequately dramatized. Big explosion, heroic sacrifice, we're back at camp, Atreus leaves to find the surviving giants, and Kratos finds another giant mural that predicts he will one day be worshipped as a great builder rather than feared as a great destroyer. Jacob Geller, a YouTuber I love and have been subscribed to for years, in his video on favorite games in 2022 says, The realization of what the game is ultimately about, a realization that comes something like 
35 hours in. It hits like a goddamn truck. Joe Abercrombie, an author who I love and have been reading for years in his recap of games he played in 2022, says, Don't get me wrong, class-leading writing, acting and character design with some genuinely emotional moments, but it didn't blow my mind the way the previous installment did. I think these two are referring to the same issue. The reason it takes Jacob 35 hours to realize what the game is ultimately about and why Joe's mind wasn't blown away is because Ragnarok doesn't build to its conclusion but rather just arrives at it. To ultimately arrive at a mural depicting Kratos worshipped as a builder is a shock because no part of Kratos' journey was about or even referred to his desire to be worshipped. The one mention of worship comes from Odin after they forged the Dropnir spear. Return my son, or you may meet the god I once was. And what kind of god? Is that Kratos? What do you even know of Godhood? In your lifetimes, has anyone ever worshipped you? Ever prayed to you? Can you even imagine that kind of love? No! You don't care about mortals. You don't care about anything beyond yourself, beyond the monster who kills without cause. And I, I, I get that this is actually less about worship and more about Kratos truly being forgiven for his past, though the ancient Greeks could not be reached for comment. But I still maintain the story wasn't designed to reach this conclusion, and so it arrives out of nowhere. Hey, this is me in the editing booth. Future me. This is why I look like I'm in my pajamas, because I am. It's not entirely fair for me to say that the game doesn't reference whatsoever that Kratos' journey is leading towards the mural that predicts he'll be a great builder. Because at the very opening, when you fight Thor, Thor says out loud that we are destroyers, we're not builders. So he, he says it. So, you think you can come here, become a daddy, get a clean slate? That ain't how it works. You're a destroyer, like me. And then, 35 hours later, he says it again in their final fight. We don't change. <sighs> Destroy us! So, yes, the game does mention twice across a 35 hour gap that Kratos and Thor are destroyers, not builders. I still don't think that's good. I still don't think it's woven throughout the entire 35 hours, but I have to give it its due. They do mention it twice. These are still emotional moments, so you might still feel something when they do arrive, but they didn't work for me because the story doesn't build to them. And yet maybe this feeling of disconnection was the writer's intent all along. We're not intentionally setting out to do those things. We're putting them there. And if you're willing to go into that suspension of disbelief in a place where it'll open you up to freely think, then that's the result. And it's really amazing. But it's not like, you must feel this way. Like I never go into thinking a scene needs to do that because it's, that's manipulative. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to leave it for you. And if it connects because of all the little pieces that have come together, then we've, we've hit the sweet spot. I think this is a fundamental misreading of how stories are constructed because stories are manipulation. They're carefully constructed to make the audience feel a certain way at a certain moment. And the audience is aware of this. When we sit down for a comedy, we want to laugh, for a romance to fall in love, for a drama to cry. We choose the experience we wish to have at that given moment. It's assumed that we're playing God of War Ragnarok because we want to hit things really hard in the face, and we want to let it hit us really hard in the fields. And I think Eric Williams knows this too, considering how Brock is referred to as the family dog. You don't put the family dog down and expect someone not to feel anything. However, Given William's statement, maybe the writers purposefully shied away from setting up God of War Ragnarok's narrative in a more traditional way and chose to leave an off-screen breadcrumb trail of plot threads and character motivations for the audience to interpret should they choose to. But I'll be honest, I just don't vibe with that style of storytelling for a cinematic game. Take Freya, for example. 
Freya is, at first, consumed by her need for revenge against Kratos. In my comments section, Thembani the One had a galaxy brain take on Freya's change of heart after a boss fight that, quite frankly, is so good it made me angry. He says, The reason she reacts the way she did when Atreus transforms makes sense if you remember what she screamed at him after Baldur's death. You were just an animal! Passing on your cruelty and rage, you will never change! She believes she is the better parent in that moment and genuinely fears for what Atreus will become if left in the care of this brute. When Atreus literally turns into a rageful beast, Freya realizes that she was about to create another Kratos. Violence begets violence. Like I said, galaxy brain take. I just wish this was actually supported by the text because I don't think it is. And I think this take is a bit of a stretch even though I love it and it's awesome. Then she pivots the focus of her revenge from Kratos to Odin and pursues that. We're not taking the fight to Odin. I should help my brother stand against him. Odin won't stop until we stop him. We need you here. Odin has taken so much from us already. This ends today. Why have you stopped? Ragnarok is here. We finally have Odin right where we- We will stop Odin. Bow to your queen all the way up until the moment she has it, when she suddenly lets it go, seemingly for no reason. I don't need this to make me whole. Now, I can draw an interesting parallel between what she says to Odin. I spent many long winters thinking about what I would say to you as I watched you take your last breath. And what Balder says to Freya in God of War 4. I've spent the last 100 years dreaming of this moment. I've rehearsed everything I ever wanted to say to you, every word, to make you understand exactly what you stole from me. These are two moments from two different games released several years apart. If a person is supposed to connect these two dots in order to understand why Freya gives up vengeance, then I'm sorry, but most people aren't going to make that connection, nor should they be expected to. As it is, her change of heart at the climax of the game is as abrupt as her change of heart at the end of her boss fight. Segmented storytelling like this works for Dark Souls, but I don't think character motivation in a story-forward game like God of War Ragnarok should be treated like an item description in a From Software game. In God of War 4, I completely understand why Freya ultimately lets Baldur kill her, because everything about her character led up to that heartbreaking decision. In God of War Ragnarok, it's not Freya's character who spares Odin, but the message they want to drive home that vengeance is bad. But we will die seeking justice. Not vengeance. Except when it comes to Sindri. The whole game, Sindri has been there for Atreus, providing more knickknacks and doodads that aid their journey and freely giving Atreus advice because he cares for him. Even after the mauling, he continues to care for him. Then, Odin as Tyr stabs Brock. Sindri is broken and he blames Atreus. I gave you everything. My skills. My friendship. My home, my secrets, my treasures, and you just kept taking. And now what have I got? <laughs> Not even my family. Though Sindri remains mad at Kratos and Atreus for the remainder of the game, he does get to smash Odin's marble and take his revenge, but it's a real want-to-have-your-cake-and-eat-it-too moment where you want to drive home the message that vengeance is bad and that you shouldn't pursue it, but you still want Sindri to have his vengeance. But don't just take my word for it. Brock will die, but then Sindri will be the one to take the vengeance because everybody else has grown past needing the exact that, yeah. but he's just fresh in it, so he'll have to be the one to do it, and then it just feels so satisfying when he uh, hammer smashes that marble. Oh, I need a fucking cigarette! Sindri's pain means a lot to Sindri, and it means a lot to Kratos and Atreus, and sure, it means a lot to us, too. But let me ask a question. How does Sindri's arc from generous friend to grieving brother inform the rest of the narrative? What is it actually saying about the story of God of War Ragnarok? I'm pretty sure Eric Williams and the writer, they're just saying, hey man, that's life. Sometimes people die, and you just gotta deal with that. You know, you can kill characters and you may not care, but that's how life goes. 
And then usually the person that's close to you is the one you don't want to lose. And when you do, that's what hurts the most, so. But this is a story. This isn't real life. If you leave something hanging open like that, it becomes less of a compact narrative where all the pieces are working towards a whole, and it becomes serialization. I think it's actually pretty telling that in several of Eric Williams' interviews, people he's talking to say, I want to see what happens with Sindri. I want to see where their story goes in the next game, which to me sounds like this game didn't do its job. And that's what I'm getting at when I say that God of War Ragnarok doesn't know how to effectively communicate the theme it wants to convey. Sure, the story touches on a lot of different themes, parenting, trust, responsibility, atonement, forgiveness, but it doesn't explore any of them in a particularly meaningful way. Williams ends his GameSpot interview with this. So we want you to have a really good time, but if, you know, you can think about a couple things, there's some subtext in there that clicks with you and, and makes you a better person then awesome because video games should be able to do that films tv movie they all books they all do those things why why can't video games and he's right video games should be able to express complex themes that inspire us to be better people and that's kind of what made me so excited about god of war 4 it really nailed down the basics of just simple storytelling nailed it down so well that how we felt through that first game carried all the way through the second game but without a strong narrative imperative characters with clear narrative functions the regular cathartic closing of knowledge gaps, a satisfying dialectical order, and a whole lot of and thens, God of War Ragnarok is just a disappointment. It knows the specific story beats it wants to hit, it knows the emotions it wants us to feel, but it either doesn't know how to weave it all together or it purposefully didn't to avoid manipulation. You will be next.